Okay, so thank you all for joining us here for this uh, important discussion that we're hosting. Uh, before we start officially, I would like to acknowledge that we here at the Campbell River Art Gallery live, learn, and gather daily on the unceded traditional territory of the Liquitaq people, the Wiwakai, the Wiwakam, and the Kwika First Nations, whose historical relationships with the land have existed for thousands of years and continue to this day. Uh, I first settled on this land uh, just over 20 years ago, and I've left and come back and left and come back and left and come back, and I've I've never really been able to put my finger on why I kept coming back uh, until just sort of recently, I kind of figured out that it just kind of felt like home. And I don't, I'm not really sure why, but it just feels right to be here. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that my strange connection to this place is nothing compared to the connection that the indigenous people of this land feel for this place. And uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge and celebrate that just as we are trying to do here at the art gallery every day by um, elevating the voices of indigenous people and other underrepresented communities and artists. Um, which brings us kind of to why we're here today. Um, we are just about to close our current exhibition, which is celebrating and showing off our permanent collection, uh, which tells the story of collecting practices and donations received since we opened in 1994. And as we adopt decolonizing practices and engage in reconciliation, it's important that we reflect on how that story represents the ongoing history of art and culture here in Campbell River and in the remote communities that we serve. Um, but our collection is uh, telling a story that is not reflective, in fact, of that region. And while we're grateful for all of the works in our collection, uh, it's important to ask ourselves what stories are, are we missing from that collection and, and how can we improve that? And that's kind of why we're having this discussion today is because we all need to improve that and we all need to take responsibility for improving that. And so we've brought together some people to talk about those ideas. And uh, the first is Ellen Walker, who is a uh, curator and scholar based in what is presently known as Toronto. Her work explores questions of representation, place making and inclusion in the arts as they pertain to distinct positional, cultural, and institutional contexts. And now you can tell this is where I've started reading because I want to get these things right. Uh, Orvis Starkweather is our second guess. Orvis knows from experience how record keeping practices can hurt, frustrate, and overwhelm. This knowledge drew them to work with historical and cultural organizations to help shape which stories are told and how, which is perfect for what we're talking about today. And my friend and colleague, Janelle Pasejnik, right? Is that correct? I don't know that I've ever actually said her name out loud. <laughs> Did it perfectly. Uh, hey, look at me. Uh, is uh, the curator of contemporary art here at the art gallery. She completed her MA in art history and visual studies at the University of Victoria on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations in 2015. And the work done on her MA thesis continues to inform her curatorial practices. So just quick before we, uh, she's gonna be facilitating this discussion and I'm gonna stop talking because nobody wants to listen to me. Uh, but I will say that uh, if you, there is gonna be a Q and A section at the end of the discussion. If you're uncomfortable asking your question on video, which is being recorded, you can drop it in the chat and I will copy and paste into a document that I can then forward the questions on to the uh, the panel during the appropriate time. And so now I will pass it over to uh, Janelle to take it off. Thank you very much, Mike, for those introductions. Um, and thank you so much to Orvis and Ellen for joining us today. Um, 
I am feel really grateful to have your breadth of experience um, to have this really important discussion. And I think it's um, exciting because the experience um, that each of you brings is quite diverse. And so I think we're going to be able to have a nice well-rounded talk today. So one thing I wanted to do to kind of start us off and ground the conversation, um, you know, is to ask the classic question of why is this so important? Why are we here having this discussion today? Um, I mean, in this current political and social climate, um, what has kind of brought us all together around these topics? And so I'd like to um, begin by asking you two to address that. Orvis, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, no. So, I mean, I, I think uh, representation is such, you know, uh, like on one hand, it is both like so important, um, you know, I think, you know, growing up as like, you know, a, you know, a like queer trans kid and like, just like not seeing yourself anywhere. Um, it feels really like discouraging and like isolating um, and has a, has a huge impact um but I also want to like acknowledge that you know it's only like part of the conversation and that like representation on its own like isn't enough like sometimes you're like oh I've been asking for representation and like you know so excited and then you kind of like hang on to these you know um uh characters that might be like problematic that kind of come through and through the media or that, you know, you can get to like representation without changing like the power structures like underneath it. And so I get like, it is very much like an indicator of some of the areas that, you know, um, uh, you can be working on and growing, but um, it really is, you know, one tool in an ecosystem of what we're, we're thinking about when it comes to um, equity and justice. Oops, I was muted. Um, and I would just say um, um, thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I'm really inspired by all of your work um, and by Canberra River Art Gallery's um, um, critical project that they're sharing with us um, so generously. Um, for me, um, my my practice centers on critical engagements with um, diverse artistic forms and communities and publics. Um, something that I, I think about a lot within that is representation as performative and how um, harmful and problematic that is. Um, so pushing back against um, popular kinds of representation like one-off projects or exhibitions or um, very controlled or contained artist residencies or whatnot. So that um, in my curatorial practice and my scholarship, I, I try to think about meaningful ways that um, these creative relations can take place inside and outside of the gallery or the institution um, in ways that are more than just a one-off encounter, but long-term investments and relationships. Thank you so much to both of you. And I think you're bringing um, both really interesting points as far as the idea of representation itself not being enough or this, this idea of performative representation and understanding um, how to engage in these projects from a place of real respect and empathy so that people can understand that the representation they're receiving is something that is, is accurate and respectful and also is spoken from the voices of those particular communities or points of experience. And I love that, um, yeah, this isn't just a, um, we're hoping to have these kind of um, engaged and sustained relationships that continue to build after projects and don't just have this very short um, and surface level shelf life that you know helps to tick boxes in, in an effort to be politically correct rather than to really care about um, how people in those communities are, are perceived and represented. 
So I would like to start off by asking each one of you to talk a little bit about your individual expertise and experience um, with public and private collections and institutions. So we'll start with Orbis. You have done some really interesting work mapping collections for relatively large public institutions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it and what understanding your findings have led you to? Yeah, so I thought that I would actually start by sharing some slides. So I'm just gonna share my screen. I promise you most of what I'm doing is not on slides. I just thought I was gonna do a little bit of numbers and that is way helpful to see actual lists and graphs. So um, I wanted, uh, or like, I guess like my work really relates to the show that's up um, at Campbell River right now. Um, because while at the Walter Phillips Gallery, I uh, did uh, an analysis of representation within their collection. And, you know, I did a practicum placement there before going on to um, work with the legacy art galleries at the University of Victoria. But um, just to give you kind of like an idea of how big, you know, the Walter Phillips Gallery collection is, it's about 1700 works. Um, and, you know, they're uh, primarily coming from uh, people that have a connection to the BAM Center. So people that have studied there or had shows at the Walter Phillips Gallery. Um, and, you know, we were doing it, or I was doing it with three lenses in mind. So looking at, at sexuality, gender, and like race, eth ethnicity. And again, you know, I think that there is certainly like limitations to this work um, because, you know, this was what can we find out primarily on the internet rather than asking people to like uh, do an anonymous like survey that we could kind of just detach those kind of information. So this is a lot of the time like what information is being shared publicly. And so I want to make like some real big statements about being careful with um, how we read into this data. So um, if we're looking at gender representation, we can see that, you know, 49% um, of the collection is he, him. There's some artists that, you know, it was like presumed he, him, but we didn't find actual, you know, for example, um, they might have, you know, been deceased before like the internet really became a thing. Um, so that could be one way that that would kind of shift in there. Um, we see, you know, like that there's a smaller percentage that's by, you know, artists that use um, she, her pronouns. And really like what we're doing is we're looking at pronouns here because again, we're not asking people to disclose anything beyond that. And generally what we have access to on people's websites is pronouns and that's it. And this would be artists that, you know, we also wanted to be careful with how we um, represented two-spirit artists um, in the ways that I can be uh, folks that identify as two-spirit sometimes see that as a, a gender lens, a sexuality lens, everything beyond that, but that there was an awareness there that was important to bring into this. And this is all to say that, you know, there is more male artists in the collection, but I think that people were surprised at, you know, that like there was more women present like um, than people were, were anticipating, I think was one of the um, big takeaways from that lens. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, again, this is folks that are, what are they putting out on their website? We see that a very small percentage of the, the collection is by Indigenous, Black, people of color um, making these works. Um, and there's also a huge, you know, bunch that we just didn't have any, any data about. Um, but again, you know, you look at this and you're like, this is really like, we've got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> um, and then in terms of like, I, which artists identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, et cetera. Um, only 3.8 of the collection um, had, you know, any information about them. And we really see the heteronormativity built into here because people weren't including any information about this in their, their bios. Um, and so we can, you know, often see that this is one of the, the barriers to doing this kind of work. 
Um, and so this was kind of like three like lenses that we were looking at um, that, you know, kind of like help us do uh, an assessment of where we're at um, at the Walter Phillips Gallery. Um, and one of the like really interesting, like, wow, this is like, you know, it's such a, a weird or like um, a disconnect um, would be that, you know, about 39% of the collection was on display, but um, out of the works we had by Indigenous artists, 79% were on display. So that we can see that there's actually like a huge interest and um, uh, engagement with works by Indigenous artists, um, despite them making up, you know, only a fraction of the collection, pretty much almost like it, a, if we had it and it wasn't on pneumatic tape, it was probably on, you know, display. Um, and so, yeah, I think the other way that this is really, you know, uh, important is like thinking about, you know, like when we were looking at this, uh, there was very little intersectionality across these, you know, um, lenses that were being interrogated. So, for example, there were, you know, more likely to be an Indigenous male artist in the collection than an Indigenous, like, female artist. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so those were the slides I wanted to share, um, just to kind of give you a really big, like, grounding in, you know, why this is like an important tool, um, because there are things that we kind of like learned and took away from there. Um, now that was three years ago that I completed that research. Um, and then I went on to be looking at the legacy. And <laughs> I, as much as I would love to continue that work, I think there's a few things to keep in mind about like what makes this more challenging to do at the legacy. So to start with, our collection is 10 times bigger. <laughs> so we have about 18,000 uh, records um, than what I was able to accomplish with the, the Walter Phillips Gallery. Um, and the collection at the Legacy is actually global in terms of scope. So how, like, you know, even working with like a, a whole team of folks, like I think it would be really hard for us to like check, you know, our Western understandings of these things. We're at the Walter Phillips Gallery, you know, almost all this information, like the collection was started in the 1960s. A lot of these are contemporary artists and they have websites that they maintain themselves. They're talking about themselves in the, in the media and there's an awareness that it's circulating, you know, in a like uh, North America, like uh, English speaking like language. And so there's some agency over that, but there's a, a real, uh, violence that can happen when you're trying to like shove your own, you know, understanding of the world um, into this. And for example, like, you know, I, I would have no idea how to approach, you know, um, understandings of like Hmong or like Yao um, Indigenous folks in Vietnam, um, how they would understand gender. And, you know, it would take a good amount of time, you know, for, for anyone to try and even kind of wrap your heads around that so that, you know, we need to be really careful about how we, how we go about doing this work and making sure that we're doing it in a good way. Um, and then the, the other reason why I have been hesitant to like revamp this work um, and continue it um, for the, the legacy as well would be that, um, you know, particularly as a as a practicum placement, sometimes, you know, what you can do is the plan and you can, you know, put in to, to get buy-in and share that and talk about the importance and give yourself some like talking points um, is to kind of create those slides and get it into like those nice, neat, like bite-sized pieces of information that's easy to share. But I, I also want to like be careful that when you have the opportunity to actually like do the work and the buy-in that like you don't, uh, always need to spend 100% of your time on planning. Like there's a risk that you get trapped in this kind of like, you know, having to do the, the statistics. And, you know, if that took me a couple months, it would maybe take me, you know, a couple years to do that at the legacy. And like, you know, if it's, if it's such a big project, maybe it's just, and we know that those issues are there, like, you know, um, so often it comes from folks that are, um, you know, 
have been excluded from museums telling you this is a truth and then you know you you want to go out and like you have to come up with the numbers and statistics sometimes to get buy-in to support that truth that people have been telling you all along when sometimes it's just better to hit the ground running and you know put in the time and do the work and so I you know do think that there's been different things that you know projects to have been working on while at the legacy that we've been trying to like integrate that work all along so you know when we're getting a new um like website and collections database like how do we you know write the technical specs so that it ensures they include you know Sinchopin and uh enough to took character sets so that we can put those on the websites and how can we you know invest the time in having you know meetings you know for our staff about like white apathy like white supremacy and kind of building in kind of unpacking these these tools so again keeping that that balance because like this is I'm a data person and I love data but like I also have to be careful in terms of um not relying on it too hard so that is the nutshell of some of the work around mapping out uh representation within collections Thank you, Orvis. Uh, I think, thank you so much for being thorough and in depth and yeah, and for talking about some of the limitations of that work. I think that that is really interesting that there are ways that you can start to implement more conscientious policies before having to see every single piece of data. And yeah, I, I respect that you're very aware of wanting to be Fair and I, that just makes me think of. I mean, art history is a very good example of forcing a Western lens onto global culture and global art, and then calling it um, sometimes inferior or tell you know telling other uh, forms of art and culture that they're coming up short because they don't exist within the kinds of parameters that art history has set so I mean that is just so problematic in itself and yeah I respect that you're very aware of that um, so I'd like to give Ellen a chance to talk but I was just wondering if it might be a smart idea for uh, me to show you a few images of our current exhibition so that you can kind of understand um, what the impetus for this conversation was does that work for everyone. Make sure we're at the beginning here. Okay. Um, so this is a few images of the current exhibition at the Campbell River Art Gallery representation. So you can see that we have done a similar demographic breakdown to what Orvis has been discussing. And so we were um, lucky to be able to go around and ask other institutions if they had done a similar demographic breakdown so that we could uh, kind of place ourselves in a context of other institutions. So um, what we've done is label these walls um, and sh we're showing you the percentage of representation on each wall. So um, you can see that um, the white male wall, the white man wall is very full, whereas um, Indigenous men and Indigenous women are represented by only a few pieces. Um, and then again, interesting in reference to what Orvis was talking about is that white women are actually quite well represented in the collection. But you'll notice that the sizes of the actual pieces are much, much more modest than what you see on the white man wall where there is um, quite a bit larger work. Uh, and then uh, what you can see elsewhere is that we have an openly two-spirit LGBTQ um, representation wall um, and that there are no non-binary folks represented in our collection. Um, and that we also, and there's the Walter Phillips report card. So we borrowed um, the report card style from the Gorilla Girls. So we're very thankful that they have already been advocating and having those conversations over the last 30 years. So we were able to um, kind of join that dialogue that's already ongoing. 
And um, the Nanaimo Art, Art Gallery has also taken the time to do this work, uh, as well as there's the legacy report card, and then there is our own report card. And I just wanted to show you um, that we also do not have any artists of color represented in our collection. And so there is this very stark contrast between um, those who are represented in the walls, which are very full, and then those stories, again, that are missing. Um, and so what we're really talking about is um, wanting to um, represent the cultural atmosphere in Campbell River and um, in a way that is more respectful and more accurate. And so that's really what this show is about. So I just wanted to kind of take you through that so you could see that before we welcome Ellen to talk about her points of experience. And I'm happy to bring those up again after. I know I kind of clicked through them pretty quickly. Thanks, Janelle. Um, it's great to see those images because that aesthetic um, approach you guys took, I think is really effective. And um, it was really exciting to see those images. Um, when I was teaching at Queen's University, I did a similar kind of exercise with the students where we walked over from class to the Agnes Etherington Art Center, which is at Queen's. They have a pretty um, substantial collection. It probably would align with lots of the scores in the report cards you collected. Um, and so this one year when I was teaching this class, it was highlights from the collection. There, um, everyone in the show was a white man and there were no women. And so I told the class, how would you interrupt this show or how could you do it differently? And they were like, but that's all we have to work with. These are the only works in the collection. And then I was like, well, what if you, um, what if you didn't hang any other works, but you left the whole gallery blank? And then you had labels saying that these were the women that should have been collected um, or different ways to use interruption or disruption or unsettling to, um, to not obscure these facts that we all know and see, but to more so take responsibility for them or um, make them more visible so that we can unpack them together. Um, yeah, so I, um, I've worked primarily um, outside of institutions um, for the majority of my career as a guest curator, um, which gives you a different kind of relationship to institutions and artists. Now that I'm at the Blackwood, I'm inside an institution, so it's a very different role. Um, working as a guest curator um, in terms of trying to bring diverse and critical projects into institutions, um, that kind of puts you in a precarious position because you're an, you're an outsider and you're inviting these artists to work with you on these exciting projects, but you have no control over how the institution is um, managing the project or how they're treating the artists that you're bringing in. Um, and so that kind of links back to the critique of performativity that I brought up. So, um, institutions you know love to invite you in to do their community projects which you know have no money or resources attached so they're setting you up for failure um, and they don't take your projects seriously because they're community-based even though their programming should be for the community um, so that's a that's a struggle i had um, working independently um, now that i'm i'm at the blackwood um, we have a collection there um, and it's largely unused. Um, but one thing that that we've started on the under the direction of Christine Shaw, who's the director curator, I'm covering her sabbatical for the year. Um, so she implemented a program of public artworks on campus instead of um, permanent works. So these are um, public artworks, installations, sculptures, on campus outside that are there for three years and every three years they will change. And so the idea is that to support long-term projects or durational research and experiences and engagement, but that permanency is not really the right direction, at least for us, um, to own things is very colonial. Um, and um, 
So I really respect that approach that Christine has taken mm -hmm. to sort of unhinge permanency and what that means. Um, what I gather from a lot of collections and institutions from colleagues I talk to is that the collections are a really big burden. Um, it's a really big logistical nightmare where to store these works, um, how to maintain them and preserve them, and then how to deaccession them. So, um, so yeah, that is all to say that I like this direction of long-term um, support and engagement over finality or permanency. Um, but something that Orvis brought up um, that I also find really interesting is that part of this work is that you have to also teach the institutions or challenge the institutions. So for instance, big institutions or galleries, like I said, love to have these community projects. It makes them look so good. Um, and then they have all these outward facing events about equity and transformative justice and whatnot. But how does that work internally in the institution? Um, so um, I'm interested in challenging these institutions, you know, to spend, spend their money and invest resources also in training their staff because it's not gonna work long-term if these institutions invite curators and artists in, if they don't know how to work with them respectfully or ethically. Um, so for instance, my ongoing collaborator and I, Abdi Osman, we planned um, a series of public programs with the Gardner Museum and we did a community arts project there. And part of the programming was also internal. So some skills training and information sharing to the staff at the institution um, because their umbrella program was, um, was described as transformative justice work. And so we said, okay, well, let's involve the staff in this work. And I would say maybe six or seven people from a 50 plus staff organization showed up. So there's also like huge lags in commitment um, and that everyone in the institution needs to be on board with this work or else the harm will just continue in different ways. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Ellen. That is so rich. There's so much to talk about in what you said. I'm, and I just, I think it's kind of funny, but what you're talking about um, is not having to collect, you know, and it's, uh, you know, um, changing the concept and the idea of the art gallery or the museum institution as a repository for objects, but rather as a space for um, long-term durational support, as you say, like what is wrong with doing a long-term loan for um, a piece of art, especially when we look at the statistics, it's like 95% of a museum and gallery collection will never see the light of day. So the kind of possessing and holding onto things and hiding them away from the public or from um, people who find those things very valuable is, yeah, is this kind of very colonial institution. And it's lovely to hear someone say you don't have to take in these objects and own them and hoard them you can still continue to you know be a public institution that shows works and engages in community projects and has long-term loans or works with artists to have long-term visibility but not to kind of own um, their work so I think that that's a really refreshing point of view and also I would just add that um these institutions that have collections, um, there's still a barrier to them because they're inside these formal intimidating art institutions. So um, from a Blackwood perspective, I think it's so great that these works are outdoors. Um, so they're free and they're accessible to many people, not just people that would go into a gallery. And when we're spending public money to support artists and support their work, it should be accessible to everyone. You are absolutely right. Even walking in the door is a barrier in itself. So why not bring that work screens or sculptures or whatever you can outside? Yeah, so that people can have these interactions with it without having to feel like they have to enter the kind of threshold of these elite spaces or elitist spaces. 
Love that. So can you also, I'm just interested, um, we did talk a little bit before, so how you came to work with the Blackwood because they do have some interesting models that are um, kind of informing some changes that they're, um, I guess, going along with in the field. So, um, like I said, I'm in an, this interesting position um, where I'm there for a year, but the Blackwood, you know, has a much longer history and will have a much longer future. Um, so in my PhD research um, at Queens in cultural studies, I was exploring different um, curatorial practices or models or approaches to exhibition making in Canadian art institutions. Um, looking at recolonizing harmful practices that persist, but also um, potentially decolonizing or destabling um, practices and approaches. And so the Blackwood and in particular, Christine Shaw really stood out in my research as um, peers or institutions that I look towards um, as inspiration um, or as models. Um, I'm really moved by the way that Christine has sort of um, galvanized the Blackwood around this um, care and support for durationality. Um, um, myself, like I just spent the past 10 years working independently and in grad school. So precarity is such a thing in our field and to give artists and cultural workers and curators the opportunity to work in long-term ways is so important um, for, for their artistic health and creativity, but also just for their lives and their stability. Um, so I lost my train of thought there, Janelle, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is okay. I was really just interested um, because you have an interesting perspective. You kind of came from outside of um, the institution, but integrated the work of the Blackwood into your graduate work. And then um, that created a kind of relationship of support that allowed you to come to work with the institution. So that relationship was built long before you joined them. And so I think that that's um, an interesting example of how they're kind of putting their money where their mouth is as far as supporting artists and, um, and scholars as they develop their careers. Totally. Uh, and I was just wondering, Orvis, if you could maybe talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, the impetus that got you into that kind of work, but I was also very interested in what you were talking about, um, how you, your work is kind of deeply embedded in, in the data and it's very important, but that you also acknowledge that there are these kinds of limitations and maybe where you see yourself going or, cause I think you've, done a very interesting job of kind of creating a niche for yourself, but then you also have the power to kind of move or shift your own directions. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think for me as, you know, uh, like a, a non-binary trans person, like, you know, like for so much of my life, like every single form you'd be, get, like for any purpose at all, it would kind of have, you know, like you're like, binary like gender kind of request and so I think from like a you know it very much like hits home for me like the ways that there's value assumptions like baked into you know any kind of um you know data gathering process and so you know I think that you know it's I in a lot of ways I don't think that you can like resolve the tension about anything complex into a single like you know way of knowing or being that you can outline um, on any kind of like questionnaires but I do think that we can do a lot more with that tension that like that is a really productive place to sit is that kind of like this is a lot there's no right answer how do we find our way through this and you know I got like I like pulled into the like, you know, um, culture and like heritage work because, you know, of that erasure and like wanting to um, like participate and do better um, in how we, how we engage in these conversations um, and think about that so that, you know, it is absolutely everywhere and, um, 
you know, there's, uh, it's a privilege if you think you can like disengage um, because, you know, you have to work in like a lot of problematic spaces, no matter what, unless you have a lot of like resources and you're going to be coming in and being like, how do we do better? Um, you know, and how can we, how can we do better than what's, what's before? Um, and not that you shouldn't try to get to that, like, place where everything, like, where you deeply value, like, everything. I just have not found the, like, 100%, like, you've done everything right, and, like, you know, there's always something deeper, and, you know, I think that, like even looking at how things are funded, like how things are are made, like it's it's really impossible for most people to be working in a capitalist system. That you know, uh, for example, um, you know, you, universities across the country are you know uh, exploring divesting from fossil fuels in terms of like how they they get their money, but that you know it's only a entry level conversation about like money management. And so like that is a really important lens to bring onto all of this is that, you know, you have to lean into the messiness. Um, and then in terms of, I thought there was a second part of that question that I did not answer yet, but um, yeah, I think that, you know, like it's just that the like most important aspect um, is that I, you can't disengage and that like you have to do the work deeply and constantly. Um, what Elin, uh, Ellen was saying about um, performative like work, I also think is really important here um, that, you know, you have to go in and you like, uh, it like show accountability and put in the work, but that um, so often, you know, people feel that pressure from the outside and then it stops and there's a, a deep apathy, like whenever, you know, like the, the news cycle, like ebbs and flows and people like disengage. And, you know, like, I think that for me, like one of the things I think about like constantly of like, why am I doing this work? It goes back to like, I like what responsibilities do I have as a white person to like not peace out, but like actually continue to show up for the like years and years of work ahead of me. Um, because, you know, like this is the like, you know, uh, white supremacy like will continue unless there's like interventions in every single aspect that we do. And that, you know, it, is really easy when you have privilege to disengage, um, but that like uh, it is not a choice at a point. If you have that privilege, it is a responsibility. <laughs> Thank you, Orvis. Um, so I'd like to ask kind of both of you a question, I guess that really affects all aspects of the field, which is um, how does the overall patronage of IBPOC to spirit to LGBTQ plus artists and folks with um, barriers, physical and mental um, affect collecting practices? So artists, um, from underrepresented constituencies, that kind of level of patronage, how is that affecting, you know, exhibition shows, all of the collections, the whole kind of situation? I'm happy to start unless you're, you're dying to go. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> So yeah, one of the ways that I think about, so um, when I first arrived at the Legacy Art Gallery, um, Bradley Clements with Lorley Wastasiku curated a small show that was women artists changing our collections. And it was specifically looking at um, uh, female artists and uh, adding that like intersectional lens about acquisitions from the last five years in our collection. And so from that show, like it became really obvious um, that just, you know, that contemporary like records like demonstrate that we're continuing to collect more like male artists um, than others. Um, and so that was about three years ago. It was soon after I arrived at the Legacy. Um, and, you know, we have gotten, you know, approached by folks since then. 
um, like donors that, you know, are interested um, in kind of helping us to fill in that gaps. So like, I think that, you know, it's really important to acknowledge and have this as like a public conversation with that transparency there. On the other hand, I still don't think that that's like, uh, we want to be careful in terms of how we're doing this work, because it's, you know, if you're just focused on the like outcome, um, I think you're missing a lot of the like, you know, uh, process along the way. So Elin had, uh, Ellen had some like great points about how, um, for example, you want to build these like durational relationships and having that like financial support there so that people can grow. Um, I think that we really deeply need to be thinking about, you know, even if the art market says something is worth this much, you know, like our indigenous artists as a whole undervalued contemporary because of, you know, um, systemic oppression that has uh, affected those records, like historically um, art prices that continue to like add to the art market. And so we want to be thinking about that. And then it's also, you know, anytime we take anything in, we need to be thinking about, are we able to sustain this relationship, not just now, but like indefinitely. And that is a big conversation because, you know, I think it's very easy for people to say yes today, but like, how do you transform um, that relationship to ensure that, you know, 10 years from now, like 40 years from now, you can still have a great relationship with that artist. Um, and that especially when it comes to like indigenous knowledges, you have to be so aware and careful um, about who has access to which content, like can you care for this in a way that the um, artist and their community really supports. And that, you know, it's even if someone says yes now, a big part of consent is that that can be revoked at any point in the future. So for example, if an artist, you know, um, said that like, I want this as like an artist statement, like now that we have to like kind of be doing that active consent work all along the way so that we're continuing to be like, do you still like agree with this? Like if you have any like changes at any point, you like we're so like interested to learn to that and like really breaking down those institutional barriers where people are often feel like, well, it's done, I can't change it. Like there's no going back from it. Um, it needs to be like that open invitation and deep relationships that can sustain that, that work going forward. Um, Janelle, I can't remember your specific question. So I have like a mishmash of comments. <laughs> um, before, I think you asked about expertise. And I forgot to say that I'm, I'm not an expert. And that was like the existential crisis of the PhD it was like, you're supposed to be an expert in what you're doing. And I will never be an expert. And for me, that's why I wanted to do the PhD was because I feel like I don't know how to curate. Every time I curate something, I'm learning how to curate all over again. Um, so it's always learning for me. Um, what else did I want to say? Collecting um, makes me so uncomfortable, but I'm not an artist, so I might think differently. But in terms of an institution, if we buy an artist's work and then we have it forever, there's no, like Orvis said, um, right now, there in most institutions, there's not a sustained relationship with those artists. And then um, that leaves room for huge errors or problems when the institution um, or a curator could could organize a show in a way that the artist is not okay with that like part of my curatorial work is I work in relationship with the artists always because it's their work I need to account to them and so for an institution to work with artworks devoid of the artistic relationship and responsibility I just think is so uncomfortable um, and like colonial. Um, I also wanted to say, um, like I love, I love the project that Campbell River did. And obviously I really love and respect um, Sarah and Janelle um, and Orvis's work. Um, and that like, we need to talk about this messiness 
out loud because it is messy and it will always be, but also that we need to, to talk about it in ways that are generative, like, because cancel culture is real and I think it's super unproductive and we all, you know, make errors um, and we all have ways to grow, but, and obviously critique is super important, but um, critique in terms of like constructing different futures and different practices and realities for people not to harm and and cease a, a relationship or conversation so yeah anyways I wanted to say like that was so exciting to see your institution kind of send that out to your peers in a way that was super collaborative and open um, it was really exciting thank you Ellen and I, I really agree with you. I think there is a very big difference between, yeah, kind of critiquing something to shut it down and then critiquing something to create something, as you say, that's generative, that helps us look into the future and be, um, yeah, more, uh, more constructive with what it is that we're doing. So with that in mind, um, I want to welcome any questions that people might want to ask at this time. So if you would like to use your own voice to ask a question, you can just let us know in the chat and I can unmute you or um, I can also convey your questions um, with my voice. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Sarah Lopez Asu, and I'm the uh, executive director here at the Campbell River Art Gallery. And so I just kind of wanted to speak to, well, first of all, thank obviously Orvis and uh, Ellen for their contributions to this, this conversation. There's so many juicy tidbits and that's really what we felt the whole time that this show has been up. It, it closes this weekend, but um, I think to your point, Ellen, that um, you know we want to we want to lean into the messiness. We want to invite people to join us in this conversation, and I think that um, the way that Janelle really um, installed and curated the show has created that space for folks to for folks to lean in. Um, you know, some of my my favorite um, sort of times during this exhibition were when I had to step into. The gift shop to just sort of be be a human person there um and seeing people come in and and come to their own realization um and i think that that's where it's important right um you know i and and my staff i apologize in advance they've heard this story a million times but you know i, I had a gentleman who we're, we're right next to a visitor center so we get tourists and folks who who are just kind of popping in for a map and and this one gentleman was in flip-flops and board shorts kind of thing and and was an unexpected visitor um but yeah, he had a moment. He had his aha moment uh, with me there looking at the white male wall, just kind of, you know, hummed and hawed and just went, huh, I guess, I guess it takes a certain amount of privilege to be able to make work and sell it, huh? And I was like, ah, <laughs> okay, right? So yay, we, 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 made, we made some gains there. We made, uh, we opened up that conversation and that dialogue. Um, and that's, I think, where change will ultimately come from. It's it's leaning into the messiness, um, you know, to Orvis. Numbers are fascinating, but, you know, any statistician can tell you that you can make numbers say whatever you want them to say sometimes. Um, so we can't just be bound by these numbers and these stats. Sometimes we just have to jump in and, and acknowledge truths that are widely known um and and just kind of move forward in that way and not be not yeah paint ourselves into a corner essentially um and to that point you know one of the uh the recurring sort of feedback that we've received and and it's exciting to get that feedback is um what about um neuro neurodivergent folks what about folks um with whether it be physical or mental disabilities like we we those were not included in our report card and certainly they should have those folks have had incredible barriers to access to patronage to um to art making um so it is kind of this growing conversation and i i applaud you both for for the work that you've done in creating these spaces to have have those conversations 
that's all I had to add. <laughs> there is a real juicy question in the chat um, that I thought I would ask um, both of you. So Michaela Ferguson is from Penticton Art Gallery, and she is curious about your thoughts on deaccessioning artwork from collections to raise funds for um, IBPOC and uh, Two-Spirit LGBTQ um, plus works. Um, some institutions have done this recently and have received both backlash and praise. So what, um, what are either of your thoughts on that? I'm not familiar with that. I'm really out of the loop <laughs> right now. Um, so I, I feel like I don't have, I'll let Orvis speak maybe. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I mean, I, uh, for a number of years, have been a little bit more, we need to do accession stuff, like it's not sustainable, like, you know, it is, like, you know, I think if we're going to have a collection, we have to do it well, and we have to do it in, a, like, a really good way, um, and that, you know, um, I, you know, I think Legacies Collection specifically is probably at us at a point where, you know, we have, um, I think it's now six full-time like staff members and a collection that spans the globe. This puts us in a really hard space to be able to tell those stories. And I think that, you know, we are constantly learning and growing um, in order to try and do that, but it's, it's a big challenge. And I think that we, we, are going to continue to set ourselves up um, for an impossible task unless we kind of refine and get down to something that's at least more manageable. Um, you know, so I, I do think that there has to be a conversation there, but, you know, one of the, the learning areas that I, you know, have had in the last year, um, you know, my, my coworker, uh, Laura Lee with Stasi Kud, um, has, you know, kind of been like, Yes, you're right, but it matters how we go about doing this work so that, you know, when we're going about deaccessioning stuff that there is a really like good way and, you know, what happens if we can't find a good home for something? Like what happens if we can't find like the ideal situation that we all want and we're in a very fortunate uh, situation where, you know, um, a lot of our, our funding comes from outside sources and not from folks that are um, tickets. And so we're in a different public relations situations than many galleries. And I think that there's, you know, certainly like lots of buy-in, but the, the size of the, the project is very daunting. Um, and, you know, I think that it, you know, like sometimes the, the scale of the work is really big and that, you know, like if we've disrupted this, we have an ongoing responsibility that we need to do that. So that this is both a conversation about deaccessioning, but also um, repatriation, as well as the larger context that have set up museum collections as a whole, where we, you know, often get things from, from donors. Um, and so, for example, like if, you know, we had, you know, something like from, you know, a, a local community, like our, you know, staff has lots of buy-in around, like, you know, if we got those requests, we would like absolutely like honor them and like work with communities. Um, but I think it gets particularly tricky when you're like looking at these like global collections and you're kind of like, oh, well, it's not just, you know, like the gallery, but it's kind of the ways that, um, you know, what, you know, climate, you know, was set up politically um, that led to a lot of these, these treasures and ancestors from like leaving these, you know, countries and these homes. And how do we, um, you know, like, uh, we can, if we send them like as an institution, even back with like a really good, you know, like amount of money and pay for the ceremonies and stuff that like, that doesn't change the underlying political, like, uh, theft um, through like colonialism and imperialism um, and the ongoing like you know ways that you know these 
resources are extracted like globally. So like my like context is like continues to be it's really content like complex. We need to absolutely be having this conversation. Like it needs to be like at the forefront of our minds, um, and it needs to be, you know, very collaborative and with that, um, but that like, there's also a responsibility that we have, not just like on how we are acting as an institution, but like how we are asking, you know, um, advocating for change. And so, you know, uh, thinking through like what, you know, like groups are doing like um, work to really feed like grassroots, like initiatives, like globally how do we support that like how do we advocate for change not with just within like to ourselves but also like in larger conversations and support work that's happening by um other institute like in areas outside of just a museum context because there's this like invisible wall or bubble around like galleries and museums um and you know like if we're just focusing on what's in that, we're missing a lot of this larger context, which is so important and necessary. And again, it's complicated and messy, but like we need to do the complicated and messy. I agree with you, Michaela. I have to keep thinking about it too, because yeah, I think Orvis has brought up some very interesting points that, but I think, yeah, it really does come down to, um, yeah, that agreement of stewardship and if if this object can go to the ideal place then it may be appropriate but yeah there are these kind of larger political climates to to consider especially the legacy collection sounds very complex um yeah and i do see that michaela you asked about like is deexceptioning in this case like performative um you know I would be asking like who is doing the decision making around this so often like you know a group of mostly like you know like white older folks in senior leadership at you know museums and galleries they've come to, the, to this decision um, without you know having those conversations like along the the way. Um, and I think it's really challenging to have that public conversation and not have it just be a lot of like really angry white people showing up to kind of like take that conversation in different directions. But I do think that you need to have buy-in, you know, not just at that level, but like, how do you, like, is it your like, you know, board of directors that comes with all those structures that has decided these are the artworks that we're giving up? in order to acquire new works or have you handed that control over to, you know, different folks in the community that have um, lived experiences and different kinds of stakes in that conversation. Um, so often it is, well, we don't really care about this one, like, you know, like there's still an aspect of gatekeeping that comes into that. And I think that it, it it can be not performative if you're giving like the power and autonomy over to folks and like, you know, you're also not setting them up to like fail in a way like because so often like, you know, like how do you make sure that like the folks that you're inviting in are well paid have the time to do this work like responsibly like, you know, you're looking at like multi year processes and funding that, but there's a way of doing it that's not performative. Um, but it can be very performative if you if you're not working in a good way. And I guess um, the institutional context would would play into that as well. Like for instance, at U of T, we're currently um, undergoing a censure, um, or at U of T, we can't pay Indigenous elders. Um, money like just cash like there's all these protocols and structures that really govern the kinds of um relations and projects you could take on and then you know if if u of t buys your work um do you trust that institution for the next 50 years to care for that work um yeah i mean i believe in the transformative power of institutions but i also think institutions are like very fucked up and um, 
So everything should be approached with care as well as carefulness. Agreed. Thank you. I, there are so many facets too. It just makes me think of, um, you know, artists, um, the way that their work is valued and priced often depends on what collections it's held in and what shows they've participated in. So if an artist's work is removed from a collection, is that going to affect the way that their work is evaluated, for instance? And so there, yeah, there are so many, um, kind of facets of of the the conversation that you have to look at because in in someone is going to be affected by these decisions does anyone else have any other questions for our wonderful speakers we did start a little bit late because of the technical difficulties so i think we can leave time for one more if anybody's got anything pressing that they wanted to uh, have addressed, or if they don't have to be questions, you could share an opinion on anything that's been discussed throughout the conversation as well. But we'll try to wrap this up in about the next five minutes or so. Thank you, Timekeeper. Um, if, if no one has a question, can I ask a question? <laughs> Um, Ellen, I wanted to know a little bit about the book that you're publishing with Michelle Jakes, because uh, she's like my hero. So you got to work with her on creating a book, which seems like a dream come true. But also, I'd like to know about um, about your experience and and what will be what's contained in the book. Michelle's also my hero too, um, and she's also my friend. So that's cool. Um, and she mentored me very early on in my career. So um, her thinking and her practice is always close to me. Um, so I recently finished this big PhD looking at curatorial practices in Canada, and it increasingly became more uncomfortable towards the end of the PhD to be writing this single authored text. Um, because like I said, I'm not an expert. Um, I'm always learning. So I knew that I wanted to turn this research into something that was more um, polyvocal or multivocal. Um, and so um, I asked Michelle if she wanted to work on this book with me, and she did. And then, you know, we were just talking about it on the phone, like over wine or whatever. We keep in touch as friends, right? And then our, our ideas just clicked. Um, that like um, having trained in curatorial studies and practices, um, none of this stuff is taught in school, like this stuff that you need to know. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking about if I were a young student again, what kinds of resources or practices would I wanna learn about that are, are relevant to many across Canada and so, We've invited different um, curators and scholars and activists to contribute chapters on particular projects. And so um, I was working on this book before and then I joined Blackwood for this one year position and the Blackwood is going to be publishing the book um, in the future. So that's great to um, involve this institution that really like inspired a lot of my research. So yeah, so we're working on this book. It will probably be out in 2023. Um, yeah, but feel free to ask more questions. <laughs> I, I think that that's really interesting. I myself um, haven't had formal curatorial training, but I think quite a lot about going back and um, trying to kind of elevate my like theoretical understanding of the field, but then I also find what you're saying to be extremely interesting that the, the training that we're all looking for may not necessarily be available at this juncture and what needs development is a more kind of practical experiential approach to the field that actually um, takes care of or addresses some of these really 
important issues about you know working relationally with artists and privileging artists voices and understanding how to create um, like long term sustainable healthy projects that support people's careers and um, I feel very um, privileged to work within an institution where our team is small and where I've had an opportunity to take part in strategic visioning and also doing things like uh, writing and forming the mandate. But, um, you know, a lot of folks don't have that. Um, or you're talking about precarity as an independent curator and you want to work kind of according to your values, but also need the stability to survive and to be able to participate in the field by eating and having a home. <laughs> so there are so many kind of concerns and facets that, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll turn your book into a, a field school or something. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to everyone for for coming and taking the time to be with us today. And I think this has been such a, an interesting conversation. And I, I feel so grateful that um, that we got to, you know, bring it out in the open and to have this and I hope that we're able to, to do more of these types of conversations and, and I really agree with you, Ellen, that it is important that we do think about um, our critiques as being generative you know, and what can we, what can we create moving forward that helps us to uh, understand a better way of being. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been incredible to have such a great conversation and to, yeah, uh, learn about the work that Campbell River Art Gallery is doing. I think it takes a lot to kind of put yourself out publicly like this. Um, and uh, yeah, Elin, you had such great points that I've got lots to be thinking about going forward. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we wish you all a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And we welcome uh, your feedback uh, on the talk and, and also any additional questions that you may think of later on. We're happy to keep the conversation going. So we wish you all well and um, good health and safety. Thank you. Bye. Take care. You too.